Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Doug Sesserman, privileged to serve as the Chief Executive Officer of American Associates Ben Gurion University of the Negev. I'm in, my, I'm in my virtual office in New York City. We're streaming live on Facebook. Welcome to our fourth webinar featuring Ben Gurion University's terrific work combating COVID-19. This is our fourth webinar on the subject. Uh, and then today we have special guests uh, who are both the current student as well as alums from our medical school for international health. I want to begin by just thanking Melody Mokhtarian, Dana Ben Benjamin, and Ronnie Strongen and the marketing team for all their work behind the scenes in producing this. And special acknowledgement to Ben Gurion University's president, uh, Professor Daniel Chem Shamovitz, and Jeff Kay who under their leadership have put together an incredible uh, multidisciplinary research effort to combat COVID-19 with more than 50 different projects. Uh, we're very proud of the work and happy at American Associates to do awareness building and ultimately fundraising to support the great work of Ben Gurion University. So this is how the webinar will work. We have a number of you that have participated in the past and some of you are joining us for the first time. If you have a question for one of the panelists, you simply click on the Q&A function. When you click on the Q&A function, you can write your question to any of the particular panelists. Throughout the webinar, I will be spending time looking at those questions and then we'll ask them at the end of um, each panelist's uh, discussion. And the way the program will function is each panelist will talk for 10 to 12 minutes and we'll use the last 20 minutes or so for Q&A that will be moderated with the audience. So let's begin. Today we have a great set of panelists, three, um, three, three panelists, all from the Medical School for International Health. For those of you who are unfamiliar, Ben Gurion University has two medical schools, one called the Goldman School that teaches doctors um, <laughs> in Hebrew and one that is an English program, everything taught in English, same faculty actually, called the Medical School for International Health, that is one, that is one of the leading uh, uh, educational centers in the world, really, for doctors that want to do work in the developing countries. Okay, so we're going to begin with Daniel Luz Freundlich. He's a second year medical student at BGU's Medical School for International Health. He's also the vice president of Refua Solutions, and he will be talking about software that he developed that is helping accelerate clinical tri trials for COVID-19 treatments. We're then, gonna, then going to transition to Dr. Patrick O'Connor, who's a graduate from 2002 with the Medical School for International Health, and he's a team lead for accelerated disease, con disease control at the World Health Organization's regional office of Europe in Copenhagen. Dr. O'Connor will discuss the missions he's taken to various countries to evaluate their COVID-19 containment efforts. And finally, we'll have Dr. Melissa Sutton. She's an alum from 2011 of MSIH, the Medical School for International Health. She's a public health physician at the Oregon Health Authority. She will speak about the COVID-19 surveillance system that the state of Oregon is implementing to track, treat, and mitigate the spread of virus. It's noon Eastern in New York, 7 p.m. in Israel, 6 p.m. in Copenhagen, and 9 a.m. Pacific. Welcome to Hashtag Webinar Wednesdays. Daniel, take it from here. Tell us about your great work. Um, so thank you very much again. Um, it's a great honor for me to be here and sit virtually to, very, to this very successful uh, um, colleagues of mine. Um, so I will be very happy to share with you uh, some of the uh, adventures I've been going on for the last couple of months. Um, and I want you to think about, about me two years ago. I'm not a medical student yet, and I'm working for uh, a hepatology lab where we, uh, what we do basically, we are looking for new drugs for uh, 
different and various uh, hepatology diseases. And then uh, the head of the lab comes to me and he knows my background in computer science and he says, uh, hey, Daniel, like, I know you have good computer skills. Like, why, why wouldn't we use it and uh, try to bring to, to this industry something fresh that will help physicians and uh, other investigators um, tools in order to understand which patients will feel will match and fit into specific clinical trials and we started to develop a, a platform that that's what they do we basically help um, these physicians to understand if the patient that they see in the clinic actually fits to one of the clinical trials that is going on um, and you know we we developed a, product, a prototype, uh, it took us a while and also to understand the market and then COVID-19 uh, hit us like a lot of other businesses and uh, hospitals. And then we were, were stuck. We were thinking how we could proceed uh, developing our product without uh, those clinical trials that got into hold. Um, and then we decided to, to donate our product to uh, every to everyone when every investigator or any pharma pharmaceutical company that develops uh, a vaccine or a drug that uh, combat the COVID-19 virus. Um, we decided to do it with no cost. As I said, we decided to donate it. Um, a lot of people ask me, um, wh when will the drug or when will the vaccine will be available for COVID-19? And, you know, the secret, or to be honest, it it's already available. It's already there. The problem is that this drug or this vaccine has to go through uh, some kind of process. And this process is called the clinical trial. Um, and, this, and this clinical trial takes time. And, you know, there is phase one, phase two, phases where this drug is being tested on animals and then on humans, and then it gets into phase three. And in phase three, there is a big challenge. There is a big obstacle because we need to find the right patients with very specific inclusion and exclusion criteria um, in order to enroll them to this very specific uh, trial. Um, and this is usually where this drug is uh, delayed and in order to accelerate this process, this is what we're uh, um, trying to uh, provide or to, to, to accelerate this process. So wh why this phase three? Uh, so just to, just, to be, just to be clear for the audience, Daniel, so your, your team at Refuse Solutions isn't trying to come up with the vaccine. You've developed a software program that you're calling PI Enroll, if, if I understand that correctly. And it accelerates patient enrollment in COVID-19 trials by providing clinical investigators with ready access to trials inclusion and exclusion criteria. Correct. So, what, maybe, maybe I wasn't clear. Um, we are not developing drugs or vaccines, but we do help to accelerate the process of making these drugs and vaccines available uh, as fast as possible. And the, f the reason why it's delayed or the reason why it's not available yet is because these drugs has to go through this clinical trials process. And why this process takes time, it takes time because we need to find, uh, it, it's not an easy task to match the patients into a clinical trial. First of all, not all the physicians are, are aware of these trials. And this is the first challenge that we are trying to mitigate. Um, the second challenge is to understand if the patient that is in front of you will fit or not match. And um, there's also the challenge of study team communication among, among the physicians within the site, within the hospitals. Let's say I, I see a patient, but I'm not the principal investigator. I'm not the, the leader of a specific clinical trial in the hospital. And I have some questions regarding this trial. Um, so I, I could forget about it, but I could also uh, try and contact this leader of the clinical trial 
and um, this is basically what we provide. We, we, we try to bridge this communication uh, gap and we are basically bridging between physicians and pharma companies and clinical trials um, in a various ways. We have very interesting features that we included in our app that I will be very happy to show you later if we have the time. Um, but we, we made alerts from the lab that shows a positive PCR result and we, 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 are, we have this bulletin board that basically allows physicians to talk with each other within the site, within the hospital, but also outside of the hospitals with other doctors that face the same problems with enrolling patients. Um, and right now we are working on also developing a global uh, communication network where uh, physicians from all over the world could discuss which clinical trials uh, they think are better or worse and which ones uh, we should try and accelerate. Um, so, so far we provided our platform to, to 15 sites, uh, sorry, 15 clinical trials. Um, and we got some feedback and it was very positive. Um, as I said, we are a startup company, so we don't have the resources to follow up with all these clinical trials and understand um, how effective it was at this point. I'm sure we will in the future. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't want to get into too much details right now. I, I will be very happy to explain and elaborate more uh, after the other panelists will have their opportunity to speak. That sounds great. And by the way, for, for everyone who's participating, Daniel's doing all this with his new company while he's a second year student at the Medical <laughs> School for International Health. It's a, it's amazing, uh, maybe a new paradigm and benchmark for multitasking. Daniel also um, is born in Israel, you can hear that in his accent, and he joined the IDS Submarine Academy for his compulsory service. He holds a BS in Applied Computer Science from the University of Winnipeg, which he also referenced. So let's move on to the other panelists and we'll come back to you, Daniel, thank you so much. Thanks, of course. Joining us from Copenhagen, Denmark is Patrick O'Connor, Dr. Patrick O'Connor. He's a 2002 alum of BGU's Medical School for International Health. Dr. O'Connor serves as team lead for accelerated disease control at the World Health Organization's regional office for Europe in Copenhagen. Since graduating MSIH, Dr. O'Connor earned his master's of public health from Johns Hopkins University where he also completed his residency in general preventative medicine. Over the course of his public health career, Dr. O'Connor has worked in several countries, including Darfur, South Sudan, Indonesia, Jordan, India, and Pakistan. He has served in various leadership and technical positions for UNICEF headquarters in New York, the World Health Organization's regional office in New Delhi and Copenhagen, and the centers for disease control and prevention in Atlanta. Dr. O'Connor is completing a series of World Health Organization missions with the goal of evaluating various countries' COVID-19 containment efforts. Most recently, he conducted mission work in Belarus and he's currently planning a trip to Turkmenistan to assist in their preparedness and response. Wow. <laughs> uh, Patrick, Dr. O'Connor, thank you so much for joining us. Why don't you fill us in a little bit on your work? Great, uh, thanks Doug for the introduction. And um, yeah, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk uh, with the other panelists and then also to um, field questions at the end. Uh, so as you said, I'm a, so I'm a medical epidemiologist and I've been working at the WHO Regional Office for Europe uh, for about five years. and. Uh, my normal job is with the, I'm the team lead for accelerated disease control in the vaccine preventable disease and immunization unit. And so I mostly work on um, measles and rubella elimination in the European region, as well as um, maintaining their polio free status. And so those are the, the main areas that I work on normally. Um, and uh, just to let you know, so the WHO regional office is headquartered in um, Copenhagen, Denmark, 
and we cover 53 countries from Copenhagen. Um, so normally I have a very busy travel schedule providing uh, technical assistance uh, to ministries of health on their uh, programs to work on measles and rubella elimination and polio free status. And so that covers all of, um, all of what you think of as Europe, Central uh, Asia, the Caucasus, and then I also cover Israel, which is a pleasure to be able to visit and, and provide support there. I, I had my last mission um, before the shutdown to Israel to help with uh, measles and rubella elimination efforts there. So, uh, so I, I do get to visit Israel every now and then, which I, I do enjoy. Um, and so since the shutdown happened, um, uh, we've been trying to provide additional technical support to our uh, emergencies program in, in, uh, in the regional office for missions. There's been about 60 uh, interventions and missions to different countries, uh, both virtually and in person uh, from the WHO regional office. Um, early on, a lot of the efforts were in, um, in Western Europe, particularly Spain and Italy. Uh, to provide technical support there. Uh, most recently, with my mission to Belarus in April, um, we've been providing more technical assistance to Eastern Europe. And then I just returned from uh, Tajikistan on Saturday. Uh, and so we're also trying to provide some technical assistance to Central Asia. We see that the, the needs um, in the region have been uh, migrating east. Um, and so for those two missions, the one to Belarus and the other one to Tajikistan, uh, I acted as the, the team lead for those uh, missions. They're generally um, multi-disciplinary um, missions. And so in my capacity as the team lead, I also usually cover uh, surveillance efforts. Uh, and also sometimes, depending on the composition of the team, I look into the uh, diagnostics that uh, countries are using, and then also sometimes the laboratory capacities. Um, we usually cover um, the mission to Tajikistan. We had five members on the team and spent three weeks in country. Uh, for Belarus, we had only three people and provided um, about a week worth of, uh, of, of activities. And we're usually covering um, communication, surveillance, uh, we look at points of entry into the country, uh, laboratories. We also do case management, uh, clinical evaluations, uh, infection prevention and control measures. So that's sort of the PPE, the protective equipment, as well as uh, the actual using of those equipments and sort of uh, designated areas or redesignated hospitals. And then we also generally look at uh, operational support and logistics. Uh, we tend to not only look at uh, health related issues, we generally try to, because the, you know, despite this being a health crisis or public health issue, um, it's really a multi-sectoral approach that needs to happen. And generally we, we recommend a very blended approach looking at, um, looking at lots of different aspects. So we generally have to meet with uh, ministries of transportation, interior, um, ministries of social protection, and, uh, and then generally we meet with uh, different levels of the government at the national level, and then also at the state or, or, or district level, depending on the organization of the country. And we always are, um, the interventions that we provide are based on a request from the governments. Uh, and um, so uh, for the mission in Belarus, as well as the one in Tajikistan, both ministries of health uh, and their central governments requested technical support. And generally we, we go around, we look at uh, different uh, facilities, we ask a lot of questions, we look at documents, um, we visit hospitals, we put on gowns and go into uh, ICUs and other facilities. Uh, we go into laboratories and look at testing procedures. Uh, and then we come together and generally make a, uh, a, a list of recommendations based on what we've seen and discuss those with the government. And uh, we also, um, for the last, for the mission in Belarus, as well as Tajikistan, we generally have a press conference where we discuss the, uh, in sort of a very transparent and open way, we discuss the observations and recommendations, uh, usually with uh, reporters uh, and with the ministries of health. 
uh, and then we field questions from those uh, reporters either online or in person depending on the, the forum and so we think it's just as a good way to keep the the dialogue with uh, with uh, with not only the ministries but also with, uh, with the public in general and it provides an opportunity for us to interact and uh, get questions answered very similar to the forum that we have here today so I think um, the other thing to say is that things are changing so quickly and the things that we know are so rapidly advancing that um, I think these missions that we've been taking we learn so much from each mission and that we're able to sort of uh, transfer that knowledge in our, our different interactions. And so I think it's quite useful. We published all of our, um, uh, or at least a truncated version of our observations and recommendations on our websites. We asked the ministries to also do that. We have them translated into different languages depending on the, the, uh, the country. And uh, yeah, and often we, we often help with uh, uh, implementing the recommendations, so we make generally a very long list of things that need to be sort of either optimized or um, worked on in a particular country. And so uh, some countries need a lot of help and some countries need very little help. And so we try to tailor uh, the response to that appropriate, uh, pro appropriate measures. Some countries have lots of capacities uh, and don't need a lot of help and just need some, some observations and recommendations and others need um, more intense uh, interventions. Um, and so the other thing I would mention is that because international travel has become so difficult uh, that the operations and logistics of a lot of these visits is, uh, is extremely difficult. And so uh, getting in and out of countries and, uh, and um, transiting countries is quite difficult with all the restrictions. And so we, we do, depend on the goodwill of neighboring countries and, uh, and other governments to, to help us uh, transit and get on flights that are normally not available uh, to get in and out of countries. And so it's, uh, it, it's a big operation, uh, but I think it's uh, sort of our duty to ensure that we're, we're providing the best technical assistance we can and, uh, and helping countries work through this process. Uh, th thank you, thank you, Dr. O'Connor. The the sure. questions are starting to build from the audience. Sure. So for participants, again, if you have a question, click on the Q and A function and just type your question. And then I'll do my best to um, get to it and moderate it to the right panelists. Some people are raising their hands during our webinars. We don't um, we don't uh, use that raise hand feature. So just ask your question in the Q and A. And Patrick, before we move to Melissa. Uh, just quickly, could you comment on, of the countries you work with, who is handling COVID-19 well, and, you know, what are they doing that's enabling them to do that? So, yeah, so it's, it's quite interesting, you know, we, we do have a sort of set of, um, set of interventions, or at least a principle or strategies that we recommend to all of the countries, and so it's a very blended approach or mixed approach, depending on how well uh, the English is translated. Um, and, and so it's really about testing, tracing, treating, and isolating. So those sort of four principles of um, this sort of public health in interventions. And so um, I think we realized, and, and probably many people have heard, that any one of those is not enough. So you can't just sort of test and be done with it, or you just can't sort of isolate and be done, that you really need to have all four of those principles working together. And it's really, depending on the country and the context, uh, they need to be at sort of different levels. Uh, some people need more, you know, there may be a need for more testing in some places, there may be a need for more isolation depending on the context. And so, um, you know, a lot of countries are doing a really good job. It's quite an overwhelming prospect. Um, we've seen countries with very sophisticated healthcare systems, particularly Northern Italy and Spain, uh, that have very developed healthcare systems get overwhelmed very quickly. And so I think, you know, countries that have been able to balance massive testing, tracing and isolation, uh, and then also treating have done quite well. And so it, it, I think it's a real, it, it's hard to, it, it's also quite hard to sort of evaluate countries against each other. Uh, some have uh, very different surveillance systems and some have very different healthcare systems. And so 
you know, it, it, it's hard to say uh, this country is doing better than, and than other countries. But I think if you look at case counts and death rates uh, in an individual country and sort of see how they've been doing over time, I think that's probably the best assessment. Um, and, uh, you know, we, 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 are, we go where the countries ask for technical assistance. Uh, and, uh, and we try to provide that uh, the best we can in that sort of blended approach and providing as much sort of assistance uh, and recommendations so that they can move forward uh, and try to respond uh, as quickly as possible. I think we also see that a lot of countries have been sprinting uh, as they approach COVID-19. And I think we really have been trying to help countries realize that this is a marathon and that we really need to be approaching COVID-19, uh, thinking about 12 to 18 months in the future. Um, and I think that also requires a lot of attention to essential medical functions. I mean, my normal day job is working on vaccines. And so I think we've seen a lot of countries, the focus on COVID-19 has been so intense that we have, um, you know, chronic medical conditions, diabetes, heart disease, uh, normal stuff like obstetrics, and then childhood and adult vaccinations that also need to be prioritized. And so that balance is quite delicate. And so it's a, it's a, it's a real juggling act, I think, at this point. And uh, it, it's evolving so quickly that countries need to be quite nimble uh, and make adjustments very quickly to respond to what the epidemiology is telling us. Thanks. Thank you. One last question for you, Patrick, and then sure. we'll move to Melissa. So people are asking, anonymous attendee is asking, um, you know, tell us about flying right now. Is it, is it safe to travel? And when sure. you have to get on a plane, how do you protect yourself? And what would your counsel be to the participants to, when can they get back on planes? Sure. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I, I mean, I can tell you my, my, recent flight experiences have been quite um, surrealistic. Um, airports are empty, uh, planes are empty, uh, people are very curious about who you are and why you are traveling to the places that you're traveling, because nobody's traveling anywhere. Um, we often, I mean, uh, the flights to Tajikistan in particular, one was on a, a commercial airline, but uh, mostly for cargo on pharmaceuticals and my flight out was provided by uh, the German, uh, German government who had a special flight leaving Tajikistan. So we, we, we really um, uh, try to you know, use all of the diplomatic um, uh, inroads and, uh, and different methods to get in and out of countries. Um, there are still regular flights in and out of Denmark to um, certain countries in Europe. And um, uh, most of the airlines, now, or I would say all of the airlines are requiring masks on board of planes and while in airports, which uh, I think is, a, is, you know, the mask is really to protect other people. Uh, and so I think that's just good uh, public health practice and, and courteous uh, to let people know that you're, you know, sort of following the rules. The other thing is a lot of hand washing, I think, which is a good uh, making sure there, there are lots of places, I would say airports are filled with hand sanitizer stations and uh, I, I would say keeping, you know, six meter or six feet or two meters apart from each other is in, in sort of uh, spaces is quite important. So if you do have to travel, I would say uh, wear a face mask just to be sure, uh, wash your hands a lot and try to keep as much uh, uh, physical distance as you can, uh, particularly on airplanes. Most of the planes I've been on have been uh, nearly empty, and so you can have a couple rows to yourself, which I think is uh, is good practice while you're on planes. Uh, thank you, Dr. O'Connor. So we're having some technical issues with with uh, Melissa. Her video is not working, but you will be able to hear her. Unfortunately, I I believe you're going to have to just look at a video of me while she's talking, which isn't the best thing to do. But we are where we are. Okay. So Dr. Melissa Sutton is a graduate in two, from 2011. She's a proud alum of BGU's Medical School for International Health. Melissa is a board certified family medicine physician. She holds a master's of public health in epidemiology from a little known school in Boston called Harvard University and completed her family medicine residency 
at Group Health Cooperative in Seattle. Dr. Sutton has also completed both postgraduate certification in clinical tropical medicine from the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. She divides her time between public health work at the Oregon Health Authority and her rural family medicine practice in White Salem, uh, White Salmon, Oregon. Dr. Sutton is a senior health advisor for Oregon's COVID-19 response and is leading Oregon's COVID-19 surveillance efforts as part of the CDC's Emerging Infections Program Hospitalization Surveillance System. Melissa, thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Sutton, please tell us about your important work. Thank you, Doug, for having me. Uh, so first, let me orient everyone to the state of COVID-19 in Oregon, just to give you some background. Uh, we diagnosed our first case on February 28th. Um, this case had no epidemiologic risk factors, and it was clear to our team that widespread community transmission was occurring at the time of this diagnosis. Uh, our governor closed schools on March 12th and put state home orders into effect on March 23rd. Um, we estimate that these interventions, in addition to others, have avoided 70,000 cases of COVID-19, um, and our case counts have been dropping over the last several weeks. On May 15th, we began a county-by-county -county phased reopening strategy. And as of yesterday, we've had almost 4,000 cases and 150 deaths. Um, I'm a public health physician for the state of Oregon. Um, and as a public health physician, my work is really exceptionally diverse. Uh, my COVID-19 related work falls into sort of three main categories. And I'm gonna walk you through those. Um, first, I am the medical director for respiratory viral pathogens. So I uh, was hired to lead influenza and RSV surveillance, and I am now uh, creating and overseeing COVID-19 surveillance. Second, I am the principal investigator for the CDC Epidemiology and Laboratory Capacity Grant for the state of Oregon. Uh, and third, as Doug mentioned, I am a senior health advisor for our COVID-19 response. Um, so I'll try to be really organized as I talk about these, these different hats. Um, so first, uh, talking about COVID-19 surveillance. So our overarching approach uh, through consultation with our colleagues at the CDC has been to utilize our existing influenza surveillance systems and modify them for COVID-19. Um, thankfully, our influenza surveillance uh, in the United States and in Oregon is quite robust. Um, so in Oregon for COVID-19, we have four categories of surveillance. Um, first, we have hospitalization surveillance. Second, we have community surveillance. Third, we will soon have wastewater surveillance. And fourth, we are similarly launching uh, CERO surveillance. Um, so just to talk a, a bit more about hospitalization surveillance in Oregon. Um, so we are one of 10 participating states in the CDC Emerging Infections Program Network. Um, this is a network that was created in 2003, um, largely to stand up influenza surveillance, but, um, but really to stand up any sort of emerging infection response. Um, the COVID-19 surveillance system is called COVID-NET, um, and it's really an expansion of the influenza surveillance system, which is called FluServeNet. Um, this hospitalization surveillance system is really important. Um, it represents approximately 10% of the U.S. population and is considered a geographically representative sample of the U.S. population. Um, we in Oregon currently perform detailed chart reviews on hospitalized patients in our Portland metropolitan area. Um, so about 42% of our population falls within that catchment. Um, and 
across the country, the COVID net system is the most robust source of data on severe COVID-19 risk factors and outcomes. Um, importantly, this surveillance platform has several extensions. Uh, including death ascertainment projects and hopefully someday vaccine effectiveness studies. Uh, to talk a bit about community surveillance in Oregon, so our influenza system is called ILINet, um, and we've modified and expanded this system for COVID-19. Um, so we currently have 14 sites in Oregon each site collects 15 swabs per week um, and sends them to our Oregon State Public Health Lab for COVID-19 testing. Half of the swabs are collected from patients with influenza or COVID-like illness, and half are collected from asymptomatic patients. Um, as we move into flu testing, or flu season, sorry, um, these swabs will be a proportion of both symptomatic, asymptomatic, positive, and negative swabs will be co-tested for influenza and other respiratory viral pathogens. Um, at this point in time, there's very little known about co-infection, and so I think we're all looking forward to that data. Um, in general, you know, this surveillance system is sort of a crude indicator for COVID-19 activity in the community. Um, and it's one of many indicators that we look at concurrently um, and over time. So to talk a little bit about wastewater surveillance, um, there's a lot of excitement about this topic right now. Uh, it was sort of launched by um, an MIT spinoff um, called BioBot and, um, and several academic institutions are implementing this. So we will be partnering with uh, Oregon State University to launch 30 wastewater treatment facility monitoring sites across Oregon. Um, so they will test wastewater and report viral loads weekly. Um, so again, in its simple form, this is sort of a crude indicator of um, SARS-CoV-2 activity, but we're hoping that um, by combining this information with case counts and some special surveillance studies over time, we will someday be able to extrapolate the true incidence in a community from this data, um, which is a really exciting prospect. And then our last surveillance um, system is a, a series of sero surveillance projects. Um, so we are currently conducting our first uh, sero surveillance project, we are collecting 900 specimens um, to give an estimate of the true cumulative incidence of COVID-19 infection in Oregon. Um, we know that our reported cumulative incidence is much, much lower than the actual incidence, um, but we don't know how much lower. Uh, and so we plan to follow seroprevalence quarterly over the next two years. Um, in order to get a better understanding of the burden in our state. And then sort of shifting topics to um, my second hat, which is uh, as the principal investigator for our CDC ELC grant. Um, so just to, to briefly explain ELC, it is the primary source of infectious disease um, funding for state and local health departments. Um, prior to COVID-19, our annual budget was about four and a half million dollars in Oregon, um, which is actually a, a fairly large budget for our population of about four and a half million people. Um, in the last two months, we have received an additional $95 million in supplemental funds to be used for COVID-19 over the next two years. Um, as the PI for this grant, my role is to work with my team to build a cohesive strategy um, and think creatively about how to modernize our public health agency uh, in meaningful ways while addressing COVID-19. Um, 
these are unprecedented uh, levels of funding and we want to make um, changes that will last into the future. Um, and then lastly, uh, my third hat as a senior health advisor. So um, our emergency response team includes a core group of clinicians who advise the state on policy matters relating to COVID-19. Um, we try to have representatives um, from within our agency uh, who are well-versed in public health and then also um, representatives from outside our agency from sort of every niche and specialty. Um, so, you know, in this role, we partner with the governor's office um, and other stakeholders to develop guidance documents, um, inform policy making, uh, such as school closures. Um, we have crafted Oregon's phased reopening plan. Um, we do a, you know, a lot of things in this role. So that is a general overview of what a public health physician does during a pandemic. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sutton. One question quickly uh, has to do with just your own rural practice. Are you seeing COVID cases in your own community? And if so, how are, how are the people being exposed to the virus? Yeah, that's a good question. So I was last in clinic in March. Um, so I've transitioned to public health full time for now. Um, and that was because our clinic volume dropped significantly. Um, and so it was sort of a better use of my skill set. But I can speak to um, my March experience. So first, I will say that um, we realized actually in uh, retrospect that one of my colleagues was infected relatively early in the pandemic um, and thankfully practiced quite good source control. So it wasn't um, until a month later that we diagnosed our first cases out of our community. Uh, and again, uh, all of the cases that we've had um, have had no epi links. So these are not people who traveled or who knew cases. Um, these are these are people who just you know had bad luck, and um, and it really is a signal that there is widespread community transmission. All right. Thank you very much. It is twelve, almost twelve forty-five Eastern time. So we have fifteen minutes to open it up for more questions. The questions have been building for our participants, Daniel, Patrick, and Melissa. So I'm going to do my best to get through the questions, uh, but we're going to start with one for all three of you, which is why BGU? You know, we're, we're proud at the university for, of our medical schools, and we believe that we produce some of the best doctors, not only in Israel, but around the world, and part of it is a philosophy on humanistic medicine, treating the patient, not necessarily just the problem. But help us understand why you chose to go to BGU. Of all the places in the world, you could have gone to medical school. Maybe we start with you, uh, Dr. O'Connor. Great, thanks. So I, I, I'm the oldest one, so I think I, maybe I can, uh, or the, 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 the one who graduated uh, the longest time ago. So, uh, so I was actually in the second cohort uh, that graduated in 2003. And um, I think my, um, uh, my sort of decision-making process had to do with a, a program that was sort of very internationally focused. Um, and you can see my career has sort of maintained that presence. Uh, of, uh, most, of my, um, most of my work experience has been outside the US uh, working in international settings. Uh, and, and I think uh, the, the program also provided a really great clinical background. Um, I know that uh, when I did my residency, my clinical residency in the U.S., um, uh, the uh, experience at BGU provided me with a, a lot of very hands-on clinical experience, uh, working with patients and, 
and, and working on the wards in a way that I think some of my other colleagues did not have an opportunity when they were medical students. And so I think that combination uh, of a very strong clinical background, as well as the sort of international exposure uh, based on the populations that are currently in Israel was, uh, was something that was very appealing to me and has, uh, I think, served me quite well uh, in, my, uh, in my career so far. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, the program has, has sort of blossomed and developed and sort of evolved. And uh, uh, I think it's uh, producing some, some great, uh, great doctors out there. Thank you very much. Melissa, how about you? Why BGU? Why the Medical School for International Health? Yeah, uh, similar to Patrick, I was quite interested in a program with an international focus. I was coming out of uh, two years in Peace Corps in West Africa. Um, and, you know, I have to say that's what drew me in. But uh, what I'm so thankful for is having been able to train in a really functional medical system um, at, at just an amazing medical center with a population that you couldn't find anywhere else. Um, I, I'm, I just am forever thankful for those experiences. And I think going into residency, it was clear that I had had um, an unusual amount of exposure, clinical exposure and experience as compared to my counterparts. And Dr. Lynn Quetel, who runs the program here in North America, she refers to all of you as the Tikkun Olam doctors, the doctors who are focused on that Jewish value to repair the world. And I think both Patrick, you and Melissa are, are wonderful examples of that. Daniel, quickly to you, why did you choose uh, BGU? Um, so as, as my colleagues uh, mentioned, uh, I would like to add on top of it, Soroka is a very special hospital. It serves a lot of various populations from Bedouins to Russian Israelis, South American uh, Israelis and Jewish populations, um, Hasidic uh, Jews, um, a lot of very complicated uh, social uh, patients. So growing up in Israel, I knew that Soroka will be one of the best uh, or my, probably one of the most challenging hospitals to get my education in and to probably challenge myself as much as I can. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel. Okay, for those participants who haven't had a chance yet to ask a question, just click on the Q&A function and uh, you'll be able to write your question. I'll do my best to use the rest of our time to ask the questions. And then also after the webinar, we will send the questions to our panelists and they'll also um, do their best to help answer the questions that we aren't able to answer now. Uh, this one is for you, uh, Dr. O'Connor. And it's a little bit about the World Health Organization and the, all the politics. And, sure. Uh, it seems to be one of, the, one of those organizations people are, uh, are talking a lot about. So, Tell us a little bit about your career and just um, your perspective about how the World Health Organization adds value um, to the world in a time like this. And what, what exactly do you do? Sure, so uh, yeah, I think we've been getting a lot of attention, uh, both because of politics, but also because of the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, and so I think, um, uh, at least in my career working at WHO and, and sort of other UN agencies, that uh, it's really a combination of public health and health diplomacy. And so it's sort of a combination of, uh, of those two things. And so, you know, my, my recent missions to uh, Belarus and also to Tajikistan and the work that I do on measles and uh, rubella and polio uh, during normal times uh, really is a combination of providing sound best practices uh, uh, and um, uh, providing that to, to member states, to the countries that are asking for that help, uh, but also trying to have a influence at a political level uh, to sort of help, uh, uh, help the, the messages, the public health messages to be implemented or to get support at the highest levels. 
Um, I think, you know, I've had the, you know, the opportunity to meet prime ministers and presidents in the context of the COVID-19 outbreak, but also in my regular work that I do. Uh, and really the, uh, you know, having highest level support for interventions or at least responses is really quite important. Uh, and the, 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 the World Health Organization, as well as many of the other UN agencies, uh, you know, uh, the WHO's mandate is really about providing normative guidance and sort of best practices uh, that have been sort of uh, looked at across the globe and sort of bringing them together uh, and sort of sharing those. Uh, you know, we provide that based on uh, uh, the open and transparent uh, requests from a country. And then, you know, they also share, uh, we also um, ask them to share their information on a very transparent basis. Uh, and, and so we, we really don't have the power other than diplomacy to, uh, you know, we don't have an enforcement role in public health globally. Uh, we sort of, um, we sort of use our diplomatic power and our, uh, persuasion and sort of our, uh, technical expertise to try to do the best for the individual country, but also, uh, WHO's uh, built on, uh, six regions. Uh, and we try to work within our regions and across regions to provide technical support and sort of collaborate. Uh, and so it's really a very, um, uh, you know, it can be quite challenging and to ensure that uh, there's good collaboration, that we're sharing information. Uh, and I think during COVID-19, uh, things have been changing so rapidly that the out outbreaks have evolving. The things that we knew, you know, uh, in January and February uh, are different than what we know now. And I think we are, are trying to, you know, we're updating guidelines and providing the best uh, information we can. It, it is obviously extremely challenging and, and uh, you know, we're, we're, um, we're I mean, the, the unit that I work in is trying to provide support to the, the uh, emergencies group that sort of manages all of these things. And we try to jump in and provide what, what support we can. And, and I think a lot of programs are reorienting themselves to look at how they can support COVID now, but also sort of post COVID times. Uh, what kind of support do we need to do? How do we need to modify our programs? Uh, you know, for me, we're looking at how do you do routine childhood vaccinations during this time in the safest way possible. Uh, we're also looking at if there is a vaccine that is available next year, how are we going to be responsible for deploying that vaccine? And, uh, programming all of the campaigns that need to happen and how do we synchronize that across countries. Uh, so there's a, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work that we do currently, but there's also a lot of work about what will happen uh, after we are out of this pandemic and then what happens when we have a vaccine that's available. So um, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot going on on the technical side, but I would say it's really a combination of public health and health diplomacy. Thanks. Thank you very much. Melissa, this is a question I think directed toward you. It's coming from Sister Abigail Judah. She's asking about holistic treatments and uh, you're, you're coming from the Pacific Northwest there in Oregon. Do you, do you have any knowledge about any foods or herbs or spices that have been explored that may show promising potential for fighting or overcoming uh, COVID-19? Yeah, that's a popular question, Doug. Um, you know, unfortunately, right now, there is so little data. Um, so I would say no, you know, we, studies are happening across the world um, on different therapeutics. But at this time, we, we don't know of anything that's effective. Thank you. Patrick, anything on that? Um, yeah, so I, I would, um, since we, we do a lot about clinical management uh, in sort of our country visits and, and things, and so currently there are no um, uh, approved or recommended therapeutics for um, COVID-19. So all of the, the case management is really about um, supportive care. Um, there are several, uh, as Melissa had mentioned, there are several global um, clinical trials that are going on. So we do recommend countries to join those trials so that we can um, extract data and understand how um, therapeutics are being used. Uh, you know, sort of hydroxychloroquine and some of the antiretrovirals that are being currently 
used in clinical settings. We only recommend that they are done in the context of uh, clinical trial protocols. Um, and many of you may have seen that uh, uh, it was either yesterday or today, depending on uh, your news feeds, that the, um, the Solidarity Clinical Trial, which is a global program right now, has been suspended uh, while they're looking at the safety data on that. And that's really the one about azithromycin uh, and hydroxychloroquine. Um, a lot of countries have, have um, stopped using those, that combination because of the, the side effects that are, are known for those particular drugs. And so because of some of the data that's come out of that clinical trial, that particular clinical trial that's sort of a global clinical trial, um, that they've decided to put it on pause right now while they review the safety profiles from the, the cases. So I think these, these, uh, these global uh, clinical trials are extremely important for us to understand how, uh, how best to treat patients, what are the supportive treatments. And uh, as we know, we, we, you know, we are hoping for a vaccine. We may not get a vaccine that works. And so I think you know, we've seen with sort of HIV treatment that there's no vaccine, but there are very good therapeutics. And so I think those clinical trials are extremely important, particularly on a global level, where we can sort of pull information from, you know, 170 or 180 countries. Uh, and so I think these are quite important, but there are no, there are no approved treatments or, recommend, or recommended treatments for, for COVID currently. And so it's really about supportive care and your best, uh, your best uh, solution is not to get it and protect yourself. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. O'Connor. This one's for you, Daniel. It's coming from a loser, Pollock. Um, how do you balance being a full-time medical student in a second language while, while running a startup company? Um, that's a question I'm being asked uh, pretty often. I, you mentioned that I served in the submarine unit of the Israeli Navy. And I think this is the place where I learned to be able to study in any condition, in any environment. In the middle of the night, uh, next to a very noisy submarine engine, um, under pressure. So I'm not saying that I know how to do it. I'm sure that I, I could have done better, um, but it's, it's a daily struggle. And I, I, I'm trying to find um, the places or the balance, and, and it's a process. It's not like at, at the very first day, I knew exactly what I'm going to do and how I'm going to balance between these two. So it's an ongoing process, and it's a daily struggle. Thank you very much. So we're near the end of our hour. I just want to give each of you an opportunity to make any closing comments if you want, and then we'll wrap it up. Daniel, anything from you? Um, no, I, I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick? Um, yeah, maybe just a, a, a closing sentence or two, just to say that uh, I really appreciate your, you know, the opportunity to, to share some of my experiences and that uh, we, we are living in very interesting times as uh, uh, some adages say. And uh, I think it's really important for, for the alumni particularly uh, to be able, and, and current students, to be able to share our experiences. And uh, I, there's, um, I think one of the other big challenges with this and which challenges I see a lot with the normal work that I do is that really communication, uh, finding good sources of information can be quite difficult. There's a lot of conflicting information out there. And that uh, I think these sorts of forums and, and other forums like this uh, can help sort of uh, provide some good, good information and some good sources of information. So I think it's, uh, it's great and I, I really appreciate the opportunity. So thanks. Thank you. Melissa? Uh, thing. Uh, you know, I think we all have a role to play in this pandemic response. We are very much in it together across the world. Um, and so I just want to thank everyone for their contributions. Thank you, Melissa. So we're not done quite yet, but I do want to thank our three panelists, Dr. Patrick O'Connor, Dr. Melissa Sutton, and Daniel Luz Freunich for, um, their, for participating and importantly from, for your work. 
David Ben-Gurion, the founder and first prime minister of Israel and the guy whose name is on the door of our university, once said about the university that we seek to build a scientific research and teaching center, which will be a source of moral inspiration and courage, rousing people to a sense of mission, a mission that's noble, creative, and fruitful. And I think the three of you are just wonderful examples of the many alums that we have from Ben Gurion University, but we really appreciate uh, the great work that you do to heal the world and for joining us today. Our next webinar um, is going to focus on a lighter side of things. Okay, I have I'm sharing screen hopefully of our website. For those of you who are interested, you can find out all kinds of great information at aabgu.org. This is the events section. Our next webinar features Dr. Ruth K. Westheimer, the world-renowned psychosexual therapist who will be receiving an honorary doctorate from Ben Gurion University. She is so excited about this honorary doctorate that she has uh, decided to raise money for a scholarship endowment um, and you can learn more about that and also learn about Dr. Ruth's life uh, in a webinar that we will be doing on June the 10th. This one's gonna start at, at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern instead of our typical noon. It's gonna be a virtual happy hour and we're gonna talk about uh, heavenly sex with Dr. Ruth. And she's also gonna talk a little bit about the importance and guidance on intimacy during a pandemic. We have other great webinars coming up, so please check our website and, and uh, don't delete our emails when they come in. We really appreciate everybody joining, uh, joining us today. It's Erev Shavuot soon in Israel. Um, this was when God gave the Ten Commandments to the Jews, and then we've tried our best to do the good work, uh, do his good work or her good work um, through through great programs like the Medical School for International Health. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to the participants. Um, be safe and stay healthy.